in this question we have a setup oh, if I go back here a setup with a white source and a double slit and it shows two bright lines on the screen and we have to explain how this observation supports Newton's theory of light so remembering that Newton's theory tells us that light is Newton's theory light is a is made up of particles which he called uh, corpuscles that travel in straight lines so in other words no diffraction expected and we'll see lines with sharp edges and this next question we have a um, six marker where they've also given us an outline of what to write so here's point one point two and point three and we have to refer to each of these points when we want to explain um, what the alterations were made and how it explains and supports Huygens' theory of light. So for point one, the change that would have been made. So you might recognize this uh, fringe pattern from the double slit experiment. And if you remember with that experiment, uh, we needed to have those double slits to be very uh, narrow in size and very close together. So width of slits and it's and separation must be smaller okay. and the light used is monochromatic because it's saying just red fringes here so it must be a single color with wavelength similar to gap size. Okay, of, of the slits. And finally, uh, laser light must be used for this, which we know is also coherent. Okay, so you, you need a coherent source of light, which is a single color going through a very small uh, separation of double slits and the slits themselves has to be very small and similar to the wavelength. So that's for point one. So point two, uh, we have to outline the key features of Huygens' theory. So remembering that Huygens' theory is that light is a wave. And I'm just going to write H for Huygens' theory. In Huygens' theory, light is a wave. And you have to write a little bit about or how the wave actually propagates. And you have to use that wavefront model that I can use. So um, the wavefronts of the wave act as a source of more waves. Uh, uh, which spread out. And these more like waves that spread out are called wavelets. Okay. And then for point three, we have now explained how uh, the pattern that we see comes from this theory of light being a wave. So the wavelets overlap. on the screen okay and when they overlap results in path and phase difference okay and then you write your standard answer for uh, how we get the bright and dark fringes uh, from knowledge of phase and path difference so for the bright fringes uh, that's in phase 
and n lambda path difference. For the dark fringes, uh, we say it's 180 degrees out of phase, and an n plus a half lambda path difference. For question 1.3, we're given a slightly different setup. This time we have these two single slits, um, one a, a to B is narrowed in C to D, and then we've got a screen on the other side. And we, we want to describe the differences if uh, both theories of light were used in this setup. So thinking about Huygens' theory and thinking about Newton's theory, we, we have to say, well, what would the resulting pattern be? How do they compare? So we'll start with Newton's theory, I'll try up here. So Newton's theory. So remembering that light is a particle. If light was particles, uh, we should just see a central bright spot. Okay, in the middle, central bright spot in the middle. Um, and just darkens around the edges. In Huygens' theory, if light was a wave, then it is similar to just the experiment that you may have done with white light um, interference. Uh, just describing what you'd see in, in the pattern below. So again, there is a central white right fringe. Uh, and then either side fringes of different colors. And that's what you need for the three marks here. For question two, we have a uh, setup for the Millikan experiment. And just from looking at the way they've set this up, you can see the power supply, the positive end is connected to the top plate. So this top plate is positive, this bottom plate is negative, and you've got an oil droplet uh, in, in the middle here. We have to state the sign of the charge of this oil droplet for it to just remain uh, there in place. So if I just add in some forces here, we know that the force downwards due to the weight, mg. So there must be an, a force upwards, an electric force upwards, we call it EQ. Okay. And the only way that that force could be upwards, you know, to, to be attracted to the top plate, which is positive, is if the oil droplet was negatively charged. Okay. So negative charged droplet okay uh, because electric force must point upwards towards positive plate okay and that's why it's a negatively charged object uh, and his next question is a calculation uh, on using uh, the Millikan uh, equations from the formula sheet and uh, the one for drag. So it's saying uh, the oil drop is falling, and it's important to know that it's falling at constant speed. Okay, And we have to think about what the forces are acting on it as it's moved, um, falling at constant speed. So over here, I'll just draw in the forces. It's falling, but... We know it has a weight mg, um, and there must be a drag force upwards that matches because it's moving at constant speed. So we just need to equate the weight with the drag force. So weight is mg. Drag force from the formula sheet, uh, the, the viscous drag force, is given as 6 pi eta rv. So what we have to try and do now then is for us to find the mass of the oil droplet, it's not enough to be able to just use this um, uh, 
uh, equation because uh, we need uh, we need the radius of the of the droplet. Okay. okay, and to do this, uh, we're going to use the density equation with this equation, which is density is mass divided by volume. So therefore, mass is density times volume. So I'm just going to replace the left hand side with uh, density times volume. Um, we can then rearrange this equation, uh, sub in an equation for the volume of, assuming it's a um, spherical droplet of 4 over 3 pi r cubed, which is in the formula sheet for the volume of the sphere. Uh, putting all this in to the equation, we'll try that now. 4 over 3 pi r cubed g equals 6 pi meter r v. So I could see the pi's cancel. The r on the right hand side cancels with one of them here, so it becomes a squared. So if I just rearrange this to make r squared the subject, I should get 6 meter v times 3 over 4 density times g. Okay, so we have to just put the numbers into here and square root. Uh, when you do that, you get a radius of 5.9 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Okay, so now that we have the radius, we can go back to the density equation to get the mass density times volume. Um, and then we, you know, use the equation for the volume as well again, so density is 4, 3 pi r cubed, and using this value for r, you get a mass of 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 16 kilograms. Okay, which is shown to be about 8 times 10 to the minus 16. Okay. For this next part, we it's another um, show that equation, and uh, we have to try and use equations in our knowledge of forces on this uh, other uh, this droplet again as it's moving upwards this time. Uh, now that the, there is an electric field, and therefore an electric force moves, moving upwards, so we're going to look at this equation again. Uh, sorry, this diagram again with the with the forces, but because it's moving and there is an electric force on it, uh, this is what the force diagram would look like on the droplet now. We have the weight still pointing downwards. There is an electric force upwards, which is just EQ, but because it's moving upwards, there must be a drag force in the opposite direction. So it's actually mg plus drag downwards and then uh, the electric force EQ upwards. Okay, so this equation just comes from the electric force equation, EQ. Uh, so I just need to equate them because again, it's moving at constant speed, moving at constant speed. Okay, uh, therefore the equations must uh, be equal. Uh, the force must be equal, I mean. So EQ equals mg plus this drag force now we can rearrange this equation uh, to get this the subject so six pi G. And we also had from the uh, previous question uh, this equation here, okay, because this described the velocity v1 earlier. So I could also say 6 pi m r v1 equals mg. So we have two equations here. And I can just say equation 1 divided by equation 2 because it will help me cancel out all of this on the left hand side. So that will give me v2 over v1 equals eq minus mg divided by mg. Okay, so I could uh, cancel the mg with the mg here and then just do eq over mg on that side. So v2 over v1 equals eq over mg minus 1. And 
to get it to look like this now, well, if we look at the nature of this electric field, it's a parallel plate, and the equation for the electric field uh, in a uniform field due to parallel plates is V over D. So I could replace this with V over D here now. Let's say it's V over D. And now it looks like the equation shown. Question 2.4, I mean, even if you weren't able to get 2.3, we can now use this equation to answer 2.4. And we just need to rearrange this equation to get the charge of the droplet. So if you go through the steps of rearranging, okay, so we could do this now. Uh, I'm just going to write this equation out like this instead. So V2 over V1 plus 1 um, equals... VQ over dmg. Multiply both sides by dmg and then divide by V should get this as the equation. Okay, and then if we put the numbers in, we get the charge to be 4.77 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, and just to say a little bit about the numbers here, this, this m is the mass of the droplet which was given to us or we worked out previously as 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 16. Uh, v2 and v1 have also been given to us, here's v2 and v1 was the number that we had over here. Uh, D is the separation of the place, I have to be careful to convert this into meters, so that's 10 to the minus 3. Uh, the voltage is given as 715 and G in this is just 9.8, so that's how we get this number for the charge. Now, um, according to whether this supports uh, that we get the elementary charge, remember this is the total charge of the droplet. If it's made up of, say, a number of electrons, then uh, excess electrons, then we just have to divide by the charge of one electron. So if I divide this by the charge of one electron, I get 2.98, which is, to two significant figures, let's say it's three. Uh, so it's a whole number. And therefore, yes, uh, accepted value found. Okay, so if this wasn't a whole number, then um, it, 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 it can't be due to um, a number of excess electrons uh, to create the charge like this. Okay, the last part of this question is um, asking us some change that would have been have to be made here, and you have to. Look at this step by step to see how we arrived at this answer for the charge. So it says in the question that the value used is smaller than the actual value. So the value for um, viscosity of air, this uh, eta value that we see here in the equation, this uh, value right in here, the n in the equation, well, that's eta in the equations, we we look through all of our calculations, see how we went from this number, which is smaller, remember it's smaller, it says in the question, to finally get this number here, the charge. So in our steps, we can see the first thing we had to do with n is n used to find radius of droplet. Okay, so let's look at the equation that we used to find that. Okay, so here it is. So if you look at the radius of the droplet, it depends on all this, but if n was to be made smaller, we can see they're proportional. Therefore, since r squared is proportional to n, radius smaller. Okay, so the radius would be smaller in the calculations. So now let's, let's look at what we did with the radius. We use the radius to then get the mass in this question. So we can see this is what was used to get the mass in this and mass depends on the radius and the proportional. Okay. So since mass is proportional to R cubed, mass of droplet is smaller. And then finally, in this equation here, how we found the charge, you can see charge depends on mass as well, and it's proportional. So since Q is proportional to M, charge will be smaller.
For question three, we have this arrangement to find the speed of light. This is the experiment to do that. And um, what's happening here with the light, just a bit of context. We have a light source coming from the sun, reflects off this plate, goes to the other end, reflects back, and comes to the eye. So that's, that's the path of one of the light rays. It, goes through the rotating wheel, reflects at the mirror, and comes back. And then the other source is just the light going f um, at this mirror and going straight to the eye. So we have light coming from two points, really. One coming straight from the mirror and one coming from the mirror on the other side, so it has to reflect back. Uh, in this question, this is more about just understanding the equations and what F0 represents. So recalling that this F0 represents the lowest frequency um, required for when the reflected light is not seen. Okay, so you could imagine if this uh, was to rotate and it rotates at a constant frequency, every time the light reflects back it could either go through one of the gaps or it can hit the tooth. So if you have this rotating at a certain frequency, it will always hit the tooth and therefore not come back and be observed. Uh, in 3.2, we need to try and work out whether this arrangement is suitable to measure the speed of light. So there's a couple of ways you could go about doing this. If I, if I take the root of, well, I know the speed of light should be three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So, so I need a way of setting this frequency to be able to reach, uh, to be able to record that high of a speed. Okay, so if I just rearrange this equation then to get F0, that's just equal to C over 4dn. And they gave you the distance in kilometers, so that's 8,500. Um, they gave you the number, t number of teeth, n. Okay, that's the n simultaneously. Uh, and we've got the speed of light here, we put the numbers in, and we, we get the minimum frequency, um, the lowest frequency needed for this is 12.25 hertz. Okay. Now, if we look at what uh, the equipment can actually achieve, it says it could be rotated at up to 620 revolutions per minute. So I want to see what this number is in per second, because frequency is in per second. That's what Hertz is. So 620 divided by 60 gives me 10.3 Hertz. Okay. And that's the maximum force that this, that's not right, force, maximum frequency that this setup can achieve. So we can see that 12.25 is greater than the maximum it can achieve, 10.3 hertz. Okay, so since max f of setup is less than minimum frequency needed, it's not suitable. Uh, this is another question where we need to just be able to recall what the terms mean in this equation. So in the Maxwell equation, uh, we need to know that the E0 represents, um, or it relates to the electric field strength in free space, or you could say a vacuum. And mu0 represents, or relates to the magnetic field strength in free space, or you can say a vacuum. Okay, it's important to see, use the word strength here. Um, you, you don't get the marks if you just say electric field in free um, in free spaces to do with the field strength. Okay. Here's the first part of the last question. We have uh, a graph on kinetic energy against the speed and uh, the experiment that Batozzi did to investigate how the kinetic energy of electrons varies with speed. Uh, now we know in classical mechanics, 
kinetic energy of any object is half mv squared. Uh, so in other words, kinetic energy is proportional to v squared. So we're looking for like a curved line if it is for uh, um, not considering relativistic effects when things move really, really fast. So in this in, in this experiment, Potosi saw the actual kinetic energy of electrons when they start moving really, really fast. So th this can't be true because this would be the half mv squared equation will look like this. This, this can't be true though, it's just a straight line. The one that it matches mostly with is C because at really, really large uh, velocities, the uh, mass, the, the effective mass of an object starts increasing uh, to really, really large values. So the kinetic energy therefore increases to large values. Okay, so again, E is half mv squared. So the contributing factor is this m mass increases at, high, at really high speeds. So in 4.2, we have to use our uh, knowledge of what, well, what makes the total energy, what makes up a total energy of any particle. So from particle physics, we know total energy of any particle is its rest energy plus its kinetic energy. Now, in this topic, we need to know, well, to get rest energies and kinetic energies of, of, of particles, we use the e equals mc squared equation. So rest energy, I could just call it m naught c squared, where m naught represents the rest mass. Uh, and kinetic energy is what I am trying to find here. Uh, oh, no, they told us the kinetic energy is equal to the rest energy. So actually, I'm just going to write that as the same value then, m naught c squared. On the left-hand side, we have to use um, that Lorentz factor to talk about the total energy. So instead of the rest energy, we say uh, m c squared divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This, this is in the formula sheet. It tells you how um, the the rest mass, or, or the, the mass of a particle, if I just write here, mass of an actual particle uh, is dependent on its rest mass and how fast it's moving so that's where that part of the equation has come from okay so i'm using mc squared still but this is this is what this is what the m stands for in, in mc squared this time so looking at this equation i could see i could cancel quite a few things here i could cancel the m noughts if i divide everything by m naught and if i divide everything by c squared i could cancel the c squareds as well so what i'm left with is one over square root of one minus v squared over c squared equals 1 plus 1, so this is 2. Um, so let me just write that as 2. Okay, just to make this easy to rearrange, I'm just going to flip both sides. Uh, so I get square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared equals a half. I can square both sides, take the v squared over c squared to the other side, subtract the half, uh, and I'm going to be left with So let's should, should do that in steps. 1 minus v squared over c squared equals a quarter when I square it. And 1 minus a quarter equals v squared over c squared. And therefore, v squared equals 3 quarters c squared. Square root both sides. And I should get this. Okay, so that, if you put that in the calculator, you get speed of 2.6 times 10 to the mile, uh, 10 to the 8. Okay. Uh, now, final question, a bit, bit unusual, but again, thinking about what will make up the total energy of a part uh, of any object. In this case, if you stretch a spring here, you are adding potential energy to that spring. So if spring is stretched, uh, potential energy, elastic potential energy, increases. Okay, so since the total energy therefore has increased, increases, and we know total energy is given by mc squared. The only way this can increase, if you look at the right-hand side, since c is always constant, this has to increase. Mass must increase. 
Okay, the effective mass increases. 